Okay, before I get started on this video, I want to show you guys something. See these? These are trilobite fossils. And they're awesome. And my friend Craig and his wife Jennifer sent them to me. So I wanted to at least give them a little shout out here on the video and say, thanks, Craig. Thanks, Jennifer. You guys rock. The questions surrounding the myth of Noah's Flood are nothing new. Almost everyone eventually asks, where did the water come from? Or how did he fit all the animals on the boat? But it seems that for every reasonable question, there's no shortage of unreasonable answers. When we wonder how could one man and his family build a boat that could outperform and outlast anything built since, this is one answer that we get. Noah supposedly possessed the brain power to build an impossibly large wooden boat that didn't just stay afloat for five months, but it didn't even leak. He somehow knew how to properly store food for and care for every living thing in a confined space for over a year. And somehow he was able to master the technology to convert methane from animal waste into fuel for heating, lighting, and cooking. ArkEncounter.com, the website that Ken Ham uses to raise money to build his Ark replica, states that the Ark was being designed about 4,450 years ago, when mankind was still highly intelligent. Now I hate using the if-then argument, but sometimes you just have to look at common sense if mankind was that intelligent, then why is there nothing indicating that mankind harnessed this brain power for use in everyday life? The Bible doesn't clearly state how long Noah took to build the ark, but in Genesis 6-5 he's 500 when he begat his sons, and 600 when the earth flooded. Now, 100 years is plenty of time to build an ark of that magnitude, but that begs one question. Where is the evidence that anyone lived that long, ever? When we look at history, we find that, if anything, the majority of people lived shorter lives than today. Which brings up the next point. Well, isn't that just convenient? We know that environmental conditions were different given any period in history. Jerk-offs like Ken Ham and Eric Hovind love using this easy out, but they fail to explain exactly how the different conditions could cause people to live for hundreds of years or support dinosaurs and humans and even create trees strong enough to build a boat that by rights should tear itself apart under the slightest turbulence. You can't just say things were different back then and expect that to explain everything. Um, Ken, isn't this one of your favorite go-to answers? That the flood buried all the living things in layers of mud and rock? Or let me guess, not all the animals were buried, only enough to make up the fossil record as we see it today. Fine. Then what you're expecting us to believe is that after being underwater for over a year, the leftover animal carcasses were well-preserved enough for generations of carnivores to survive on. Ever seen that video of what happens to a pig carcass when left in the ocean? Completely devoured in about 10 days. I guess the upside is that Noah and his family would have had plenty of crabs and lobsters to eat. Oh, wait, no shellfish allowed. The animals didn't eat, shit, or get sick because God put them into a hibernation state. Absolutely false! In Genesis 6.21, God tells Noah specifically to take food for his family as well as the animals. Why is God telling Noah to take food for all these animals if he's just going to put them into a year-long hibernation state? If God did put them in a hibernation state, why isn't that mentioned in the Bible? Not all the water came from rain. 
The Bible mentions the fountains of the great deep were broken up. Fine, but we would need enough water to cover the earth five miles high, or roughly 1.08 trillion cubic miles of water. Okay, so let's say all the rain in the sky fell and the polar ice caps melted. That's going to account for about 220 feet worth of sea level rising, or about 0.8% of the total volume of water. The rest would have had to have come from the fountains of the deep, not only leaving a void in the earth of 1.076 trillion cubic miles, but adding 1.076 trillion cubic miles times 4.6 billion tons per cubic mile of weight to the crust of the earth. You see where I'm going with this, right? That would have collapsed the crust of the earth, which of course is what created the Grand Canyon and all of the deep ocean basins because the earth's surface was totally smooth before that, except the Bible mentions the mountains before the fucking flood. Although we can clearly define genera and species, I have yet to hear a clear definition of biblical kinds. This is another easy out to explain away the clear impossibility of loading all those animals on the ark. Still, even if Noah only took 16,000 animals, given the dimensions of the ark, that would only leave 6.33 square feet per animal. That's if you packed them in there. The workaround seems to be that he only took the young animals, but they were all on the ark for a year. Those baby animals would have grown, most of them into full-grown adults. Look at the elephant. It doubles its size in the first three months, from about 250 pounds to over 500 pounds. Giraffes double their size in the first year, starting at about 6 feet, 220 pounds, to 12 feet and 450 pounds. And since many animals suckle for their first year, who are they suckling from? You'd still have to take at least one adult. And how exactly did 8,000 kinds of animals evolve into over 3 million species in just over 4,000 years? Ken Ham mentions in AIG that Bill Nye's comparison of the Ark to the Wyoming neglects the fact that the Wyoming fell apart after 15 years of service, while the Ark only had to stay afloat for about five months. But he overlooks the fact that every time the Wyoming sailed, it had to be constantly pumped out by huge steam-driven pumps due to the flexing and bending of the ship. So who was dredging the water out of the Ark? That is exactly the opposite of what we would expect to find. What we would really expect to find if there was a global flood is just a big ass mess. Dinosaurs in the same strata with mice, trilobites buried next to kangaroos. Look, we know that plate tectonics can shift older layers on top of younger layers, but that whole point is moot. It doesn't matter how you want to spin the accuracy of dating a specific layer, Show me two animals buried in the same layer that shouldn't be together. Look, this may come as a surprise, but I'm actually cool with this explanation. God did it. Fine. Say that God blessed Noah and his family with the ability and knowledge to make the ark, or that God created the water and made it disappear. He caused the animals not to eat shit or get sick. And he held the boat together and kept it afloat. And God provided for Noah and his family and all the animals after the flood. See, I'm fine with creating an extraordinary myth and supporting it with extraordinary explanations because that's what makes it an interesting story. But it's also what makes it a myth, and not science. <laughs>